Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be visiting here. And so this is an idea, the idea of a multiverse, which has been gaining a lot of traction recently in some quarters of the cosmological community. Ensemble of universes or of universe domains, it's received increasing attention, so mainly in separate places, people like Valenkin, Linde and Guth, sometimes in separate times, people like Smolin, Penrose, um, various proposals for cyclic universes. And then one that one group of people talk about is the Everett quantum multi-universe, other branches of the wave function, uh, Deutsch, and um, then there's a lot of talk about the cosmic landscape of string theory embedded in a chaotic cosmology, people like Suskind, and then there's a small group of people who talk about totally disjoint multiverses, my supervisor Dennis Shyama talked about it, and the current proponent is Max Tegmark. A typical example, a book by Martin Rees. Uh, Rees explores the notion that our universe is just part of a vast multiverse or ensemble of universes in which most of the other universes are lifeless. What we call the laws of nature would then be no more than local bylaws imposed in the aftermath of our own Big Bang. In this scenario, our cosmic habitat would be a special, possibly unique universe where the prevailing laws of physics allowed life to emerge. And so Martin Rees has written several books. This one, Our Cosmic Habitat, is a very nice uh, explanation. Another one is his book called Just Six Numbers. Scientific American, May 2003, parallel universes, not just a staple of science fiction, other universes are a direct implication of cosmological observations, my Max Tegmark. That's pure fiction, absolutely <laughs> untrue. <laughs> Brian Green, The Hidden Reality, Parallel Universes and the Deep Laws of the Cosmos, which I will talk about again shortly. So there's a lot of hype, hyperbolic uh, stuff going out explaining not just that this is a theory, but that this is actually true. Leonard Susskind, The Cosmic Landscape, String Theory and the Illusion of Intelligent Design. Susskind concludes a question such as why is there a certain constant of nature, one number rather than another, may well be answered by somewhere in the megaverse the constant equals this number. Somewhere else it's that number. We live in one tiny pocket where the value of the constant is consistent with our kind of life. That's it. That's all. There is no other answer to the question. The anthropic principle is thus rendered respectable and intelligent design is just an illusion. Okay. Um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay, now there's a variety of multiverse proposals proposed, and Brian Green in his book The Hidden Reality, um, in different chapters advocates nine different types of mu mu uh, multiverse. The invisible parts of our universe, chaotic inflation, brain worlds, cyclic universes, the landscape of string theory, branches of the quantum mechanics wave function, holographic projections, computer simulations, all that can exist must exist, the grandest of all multiverses. Now the first point is they can't all be true because they conflict with each other. So if you're going to be a multiverse uh, uh, advocate, you've got to choose which of those are true, but there's a tenth possibility, maybe none of them, maybe there's just one universe. <laughs> okay. Now the motivation for the multiverses, firstly, uh, the, the main ones, it's claimed as the inevitable outcome of the physical originating process that generated our own universe, and this is a very um, popular one. It's an outcome of the chaotic inflationary scenario. Secondly, it's seen as a result of a philosophical stance underlying physics. Everything that can happen, happens. And in a certain sense, I have quite a sympathy of this. It's the logical outcome come of the Feynman path integral approach to quantum theory in a certain sense. Um, uh, physics in some sense explores all possible possibilities and um, uh, in the Feynman kind of way. And then thirdly, as, as you've already seen in those quotes, is proposed in his explanation for why our universe appears to be fine-tuned for life and consciousness. In particular, eternal inflation is predicted by many different versions of cosmic inflation. Alan Guth's original model of inflation involved a false vacuum phase with positive vacuum energy. Parts of the universe in that phase inflate and only occasionally decay to lower energy, non-inflating phases or the ground state. In chaotic inflation proposed by 
Andre Linde, the peaks in the evolution of a scalar field determining the energy of the vacuum correspond to regions of rapid inflation which dominate. Chaotic inflation usually eternally afflicts since the expansion of the inflationary peaks exhibit positive feedback and come to dominate the large-scale dynamics of the universe. The bubble universe model proposes that different regions of this inflationary universe termed a multiverse decay to a true vacuum state at different times, with decaying regions corresponding to sub-universes not in causal contact with each other and resulting in different physical laws in different regions, which are then subject to selection, which determines each region's components based upon, dependent upon, the survivability of the quantum components within that region. The end result will be a finite number of universes with physical laws consistent within each region of space-time. There's a lot of hypothetical physics in there, which is a point I will come to. Um, in chaotic inflation, inflating universe domains can have bubbles formed by the coleman Lucha tunneling process to new domains. The new bubbles are pocket universe like ours, but they can have different physical properties, e.g. different values for the fundamental constants. I want to point out there's two very, very different things going on there. Firstly, there's a prediction of lots of new bubbles going on. And th there's various different mechanisms approach. The coleman de Lucha one is different from the Linde one. Then the claim that they can have different physical properties. Now this is a completely further major assumption. So supposing you've got a universe which creates a lot of bubbles, you have to have some further mechanism which creates different physical properties, such as different physical values for the fundamental constant. And that's where string theory and the landscape of string theory comes in. Um, and it's claimed that this repeats giving an overall fractal like structure so this is a typical picture uh, given by Lindy and his colleagues a self-reproducing cosmos with all of these different bubbles it's different to express this because each of these bubbles has got no causal communication whatever with the other ones and this again then is a kind of picture which has been produced by uh, Lindy and his colleagues now I've spent about, oh, since 1973, 75, I've been thinking about what is testable in cosmology and what isn't. The problem with all of this is the problem of confirmation. The basic problem with the idea is that it is, with a few possible exceptions, an observationally, experimentally untestable idea. In that case, is it actually a scientific proposal or is it rather a form of scientifically based philosophy? That's the kind of question. Its proponents claim the former, but they seem to be stretching the definition of science in order to do so. And in fact, some of them explicitly say we must change the definition of science in order to classify all of that stuff actually as being science. Now, the key observational point is that the domains considered are beyond the particle horizon. Now this is a space-time diagram by Mark Whittle of Virginia. Here we are, here's here and now, time up, space horizontally. And if you plot proper distance against proper time, your past light cone goes out, reaches a maximum and come back in. This was actually uh, pointed out by Fred Hoyle a very long time ago. As you move a fixed rod back in the universe, its apparent size decreases to a minimum and then starts increasing again, the entire universe acting as a gravitational lens. And when you plot apparent size against a distance of its object of fixed size, it reaches a minimum and then starts increasing. Now, um, this is a typical galaxy, this is our galaxy world, and this is a typical other galaxy, and it starts down there at the Big Bang. Everything crunches up at the Big Bang there, and then it goes up there, and it emits light at that instant, which we receive up here at this moment, here and now. Here's another galaxy. It crosses our past light cone there, we receive its light here and now. Now the problem with this is that everything crunches up and you can't see what's happening. So what relativists do is they move to co-moving coordinates in conformal time following Roger Penrose and this is exactly the spa same space time as before but now we've changed to co-moving coordinates so the world lines are vertical world lines and we've stretched time to conformal time and now the, that's made the past light cone 45 degrees and that means this totally misrepresents time, it totally misrepresents space but it gives you the causal structure perfectly. <laughs> okay so this is now our past light cone. Everything inside here, well what is observable Everything is observable as they cross the past light cone. So this is now, um, so this is the galaxy world line. It goes up there, it crosses the past light cone there, and then it goes on up there. So 
we see that galaxy at this moment here. We see another galaxy here at this moment here and so on. And this is the visual horizon because this is the last scattering surface in this diagram. This is where the microwave background let go. And that is as far as we can see by any observation of by electromagnetic radiation. There's a two sphere there which is where our past light cone intersects the last scattering site. And the matter that goes through there is by definition the matter forming our visual horizon. All the matter this side is visual and the matter the other side is not observational by any electromagnetic radiation. Now if you use neutrinos you get a slightly further out one. If you use gravitational waves you get a slightly further out one. But still in each case there is a horizon and there's, a, there's an electromagnetic horizon, a neutrino horizon, and a gravitational wave horizon. And you can, in principle, see, in, in the sense that you've seen them as they pass the, pass, cross the past light cone, all the matter inside, but not the matter outside. The start of the universe is down there, and the last scattering surface is there. So, now the point, the problem with this that's the observable part of the universe in the sense that we have had some causal contact we can see we can see the matter as it crosses the past light cone there and we can then deduce what happens to it down in the past so in that sense this is all observable we've had causal contact with it and we know something about it this gives you the prob problem with the multiverse. So this is now showing, this is the entire visible universe yes, in these conformal coordinates. And here is the rest of the space-time out there. And so we're extrapolating from here to what's happening out there. Now, this is completely unobservable. We have no causal contact of any kind with it, no observational contact, even if you throw in gravitational waves. At a better scale, this is the entire visible universe there and you're extrapolating to unobservable universe domains out there. Now, when you make this multiverse proposal, the assumption is we can extrapolate from there to 100 Hubble radii to 10 to the 1000 Hubble radii, or much, much more. In fact, the word infinity is thrown around in gay abandon in this discussion, and I will talk about that towards the end. So, in, in terms of the real physical scale, you can go from here to my home in Cape Town, and you're predicting what happens there, but of course when you use the word infinity, supposing on this scale you get all the way to Cape Town, you haven't still begun to get on the road to infinity because no matter how far you go in measuring things, as far as infinity is concerned, you still haven't made the, ba the first step. So all of these multiverse people who talk about infinities are extrapolating from here to infinity and that is a huge extrapolation and I'm tempted to use the word hubris when I talk about that because in fact anything could happen out there uh, or it could be that there's a time like singularity out there it could be that our universe is a is an island universe and that there's vacuum out there um, it could be that the universe closes around on itself there's all sorts of possibilities we have no observational evidence about any of these possibilities and the multiverse people are proposing Proposing one particular one which may or may not be true. Now, I must be careful about this. In Leonard Suskin's book, he confuses the particle and event horizon because he says the following. He says that um, because of his the work he's done on Hawking radiation and uh, the, the, the black hole information paradox, he says that's been solved and therefore you can use Hawking radiation to see beyond the horizon. Now, what is happening there? That's a confusion between the particle and event horizon because that entire literature about Hawking radiation and the, 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 the information paradox is to do with the event horizon. In cosmology what matters is the particle horizon. The event horizon plays no role whatever in observational cosmology. So just be aware when you're looking at some of this literature, if people talk about the event horizon that got nothing to do with what is observable in the physical universe. Now. There are two caveats to what I've been saying about disprovability. 
One possibility is if there are multiverse bubble collisions, and that the people have been talking about this. During the multiverse, uh, during the expansion in chaotic inflation, you've got an exponential expansion, but then you've got some mechanism or other which is creating bubbles, a bubble creation mechanism. Now, there are two rates there, the expansion rate and the bubble creation rate. And depending on how those relate to each other, you may or may not get bubble collisions. If the expansion rate is very, very fast and the nucleation rate is slow, there will be no collisions. If the nucleation rate is very very fast and the expansion rate very slow, everything will, uh, there will be masses of collisions and in fact the whole thing will become just one bubble. In an intermediate thing when these rates more or less balance each other there will be a few collisions in the observable part of the universe and that should result in observable properties of circles in the cosmic microwave sky. And so there should be circles in the sky and some have even tried to suggest it's already been seen. I don't think that has gained any traction. I don't think anybody actually uh, much believes that. But th this, this is a disputed idea. But nevertheless, if there were collisions between such bubbles, so the bubbles form and then they collide with each other, then we would get some kind of thing in the microwave sky which indicated that that was true. So are there anomalous filled circles in the cosmic microwave background sky of some kind or other? and people have looked at this. Now from my viewpoint this would be convincing in the following way. If you could find circles in the microwave background sky where you found a constant of nature different from elsewhere in the sky, if for instance the fine structure constant was different there than there, that would be truly remarkable. How would you tell if the fine structure constant was different? Well the, the spectral properties would have to be a little bit different. So there's a whole lot of stuff that you could do which could be quite interesting there. Um, but if, if, if the nucleation rate is too high, you're in danger of causing chaotic inflation to come to an end. And um, so, so there's a small fraction of all of those possible multiverse models in which you might get these kind of circles in the sky. And if they were ever to be observed, that would be a very interesting and it would be the one thing which I would concede would be actually in some sense a proof, a reasonable proof that the multiverse exists. Now, there is one possibility also of disproof, and this is the possibility of small universes, which is something I've written about a very long time ago. Um, it could be the Einstein equations are local field equations determining local curvature. They do not determine the topology of the spatial sections of the universe. And we don't know of any principle which does determine the topology of the space sections of the universe. And it could be that, in fact, the space sections of the universe are closed. It could be that if you go out that door, that window, and keep going for long enough, you would come back through that side. Or in fact, you might go out there and then come back down here, depending on the topology of the universe. The universe could have a closed topology. Not only could it be closed, but it could be closed on a small enough scale that we actually could see around the universe since the time of decoupling. In that case, we would be seeing the same galaxy in different direction in the skies, maybe many different directions in the sky. And this is actually quite a possible scenario. It's actually very difficult to disprove. Because if you see the same galaxy in different direction in the skies, how do you know it's the same galaxy? When you're seeing it from different directions at different ages in its history, it's not actually so easy to tell if you're seeing the same galaxy in different direction in the skies. Now, what has been shown is that these small universes can be characterized by identical circles in the cosmic background sky. Because what would be happening there, you would be seeing the same circle of the last scattering surface in different directions in the sky. And also a, a, a low cosmic microwave background uh, power spectrum at large angular scales. Now that is indeed what we do observe. Um, so this is a very important test. If we could see these circles in the cosmic background sky, we would show that we have seen right around the universe since decoupling. Now that would rule out almost all of the multiverse models. However, if we don't see that, then it doesn't prove anything either way. And so this is the one possibility that exists in these circumstances we would disprove most multi-universe 
models. So, for instance, the simplest of these is a torus topology, and in that case, light going out one direction would come back that way, and we would see this galaxy in two directions in the sky. We would see the cosmic background radiation surface in different directions in the sky leading to those circles. So those are my caveats. The conclusion is the universes or universe domains claimed to exist in the multiverse cannot be observed by any observational technique whatever unless suitable bubble collisions take place which only happens in a very small fraction of multiverses if they exist. It can be disproved if we demonstrate a small universe but if that is not the case it proves nothing. So the usual process of observational testing as in the rest of cosmology which I talked about in my first lecture is not possible in the case of the multiverse. It, in that sense, it's not a scientific proposal in the usual sense. So why do we believe in them? So given the situation, what are the arguments and evidence? Why do some major scientists support the idea so strongly? Well, the first is what Martin Rees calls a slippery slope. There are plausibly galaxies beyond the horizon, yes, of course, where we can't see them. So plausibly many different expanding universes where we can't see them. So you say, well, we <laughs> go a little bit beyond the horizon. The universe doesn't come to an end of the horizon. Of course, we all agree on that. And you kind of just extend that and say, well, therefore, there's um, plausibly many different expanding universe domains where we can't see them. This is an, an untestable extrapolation. It assumes continuity that may or may not be true. Outside where we can see, there might be a Robertson-Walker model. And in fact, when I was a graduate student, this was what everybody assumed, was that outside the horizon, it continued as a Robertson-Walker model to infinity. Now, if that's the case, it disproves these chaotic inflationary models. But that was a philosophical assumption. Um, it could be a chaotic inflation, it could be a closed universe model, it could be that the universe does close round on a scale bigger than the visual horizon, that's one possibility. It could be an island universe, it might be that we, we're an isolated clump of matter in a far larger, vast, asymptotically flat space. All of these are possible because we've got no test that can be done to see which is the case. And if, if each step in a chain of evidence as well understood and inevitable, then indirect evidence of this kind carries nearly as much weight as direct evidence. But not all the steps in this chain, from saying we can see just beyond the horizon to saying there's a multiverse with all sorts of bubbles out there, not all the steps in that chain are inevitable. If employed simply, it leads to the old idea of spatial homogeneity forever, which we used to um, characterize by what used to be called the cosmological principle, rather than the multiverse of chaotic cosmology with domain walls separating the phases. Now, the, the most popular one, or in, in many cases, is this one. It's claimed the multiverse is implied by known physics that leads to chaotic inflation. However, and that's not actually the case. The key physics, coleman deluccia tunneling in many multiverse models, the string theory landscape and the link between them, is extrapolated from known and tested physics to new contexts. The extrapolation is unverified and indeed is unverifiable. It may or may not be true. The physics is hypothetical rather than tested. So if you could tell me there's known and tested physics which leads to the multiverse. I have to say, okay, we can't see the multiverse, but we know the physics, we know it's correct, therefore the multiverse exists. I'd have to accept that. So known physics lead to the multiverse? No. Known physics leads to hypothetical of physics by extrapolation leads to the multiverse. There's a major extrapolation, and what we're testing is this... That's where the test, that's tested, this is not tested, so the multiverse is not tested. This chain of argumentation does not work. It's a great extrapolation on known physics. The extrapolation is untestable. It may be correct, it may be incorrect, but we don't know. So in fact, this is the way I like to think of it. This is well-established theory supported by data. And what's happening in quantum gravity? Some people take one feature of known physics and extrapolate it out there to this quantum gravity theory out there. Some people take a different aspect of known physics and extrapolate it out there. This is uh, loop quantum gravity and that is string theory. String theory predicts that in all these different domains there might be different values of the fundamental constant. Loop quantum gravity does not make that prediction. So which extrapolation do you believe? It, it depends whether you come from the quantum field theory sides when you extrapolate that way or the general relativity side when you extrapolate that way. 
Is the key physics linking a bubble universe to Anthropics tested? This is an article by Tom Banks. The top 10 to the 500 reasons not to believe in the string landscape. And this is the abstract. The string landscape is a fantasy. We actually have a plausible landscape of minimally supersymmetric anti dissider 4. Solutions of supergravity modified by an exponential superpotential. None of these solutions is accessible to word cheap perturbation theory. If they exist as models of quantum gravity, they are defined by conformal field theories and each is an independent quantum system which makes no transitions to any of the others. This landscape has nothing to do with Coleman de Lucha tunneling or internal inflation. And this is a, um, a claim from the string side that this kind of extrapolation doesn't work. Now you may or may not believe that, but whether you believe that or not, what this paper establishes is that the, the, uh, the supposed underlying physics is certainly not well established and agreed. Okay, so the idea that known physics lead to the multiverse is a hyperbola. It's not actually the way it is. Is it implied by inflation, which is justified by the cosmic background and isotropy experiments? Now, the cosmic background measurements certainly give us a very good clue that inflation is indeed correct. But the multiverse is implied by some form of inflation, but not others. Inflation, and inflation is not yet a well-defined theory. In fact, inflation is a family of about 200 different possible theories. Uh, and... Um, you can rule some of them out by observations, not other ones, but inflation is not actually a theory. It's a framework for a vast family of theories. And not all of these theories lead to cardiac inflation. Um, this was the Planck data recently, and the Planck data forms of inflation that support a bubble universe can be tested by cosmic background observations. The Planck data prefer a Starobinsky flat potential and disfavor the phi squared potential that gives, that gives eternal chaotic inflation according to Andre Linde. And so this is from the Planck analysis of the data. Okay. Then the, the one further way that it is strongly supported, and I've already mentioned this, is the anthropic issue. The universe is fine-tuned for life. Barrow and Tipler in their majestic book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, both as regard the laws of physics, uh, and Max Tegmark has written nicely about it, and regard the boundary conditions and constants of the universe. So you have to just uh, fine-tune the universe for life in terms of things like the proton-to-electron mass ratio, the proton-to-neutron mass difference, the fine structure constant, and so on. And also, in terms of the universe, um, the cosmology, the, the amount of fluctuations in the universe mustn't be too big or it'll collapse into black holes and mustn't be too small or no galaxies will form. Now a multiverse with local physical properties that vary in the different bubbles is one possible scientific explanation. So an infinite set of universe domains allowing all possibilities to occur will suggest that somewhere things will work out all right. Now I must emphasize for this argument to work it must be an actually existing multiverse. It's not good enough for you to say I've got this hypothetical one and in this hypothetical set of, of universe models things work out all right. In order for this to be a physical explanation you've got to say that these that this that all, that all of these things actually exist. Now, this is certainly a valid supportive argument. This is a good philosophical argument. But it's not a proof, it's a theoretical explanation. This is a theoretical explanation. Um, it's not an observational explanation. What we observe is that life exists. We then are giving a theoretical explanation for that fact. Um, if there was only one theoretical proof of that uh, theoretical root to that observation that life exists it would be a proof but there are other possibilities for instance one is it just worked out that way it was just happen sense it just worked out that way there's nothing more to be said now that philosophically that is a valid explanation you may or may, may not like it but it works as a philosophical explanation the one which is most popular here is explaining the cosmological constant, and Steven Weinberg is a person who particularly has pushed this. The small value of the cosmological constant is not zero. At the present time, it's slightly positive. Uh, if the acceleration of the universe is due to a cosmological constant and not a scalar field, 
Uh, if this value was too large, there wouldn't be any structure in life. Of course, the cosmological constant would blow structures apart before they condense to form galaxies. Anthropic considerations mean the value of lambda we observe will be small in fundamental units, thus justifying an actual value extremely different from the natural one predicted by physics. And I'll mention this again in a minute. Quantum field theory suggests a value for the vacuum energy 120 orders of magnitude bigger than what we observe at the present day is the value of the cosmological constant. This has been called by some people the worst prediction ever made in theoretical physics. <laughs> Um, and I will mention how we might solve that in just a minute. But Weinberg, for instance, suggests that the way we solve this is by the multiverse. So in this multiverse, you've got all sorts of values of the cosmological constant, and they will cluster around this value 120 orders of magnitude bigger than what we see. But way out on the tail will be the very small ones, and life will exist way out on the tail. And that explains the small value of the cosmological constant. What this all shows is that the real multiverse project is making the extremely improbable appear probable. And you're trying to make the extremely improbable appear probable by having this vast um, multiverse of universes. And then you apply statistics and you say, now we've made it look probable. Um, so what? Well, the universe is no more special than need be to create life because you've got a multiverse in which everything happens. And so the, the observed value of the cosmological constant is confirmation. Um, if you only vary lambda and not other parameters simultaneously. Now, applying a statistical argument to show that this all works, the statistical argument only applies if the multiverse exists. If there's only one universe, you can't apply a statistical argument to it. And physicists immediately always grab for their statistical arguments. But the whole point about the uni uniqueness of the universe, if you've got one universe, there isn't anything to apply your statistical arguments to. You've got to have the multiverse in order to apply uh, statistics. And so in a certain sense, the instincts of physicists is to reach for the multiverse, not the unique universe. Um, if there's only one object that we can observe, we can do many observations of that one object. So given the one universe, you can do many observations. You can do just statistics of our observations of the one object. But it's still only one object that you're observing. And you can't do, do statistical tests about that object if there is only one existent entity. And from my viewpoint, this is the, what makes cosmology unique as a scientific subject. There's one universe, not a statistical uh, ensemble of universes. That's what makes cosmology the unique subject it is. But also there's the measure problem. Let's forget that. Let's assume there is a multiverse. Then in order to do statistics, you've got to know a measure. And we don't know the measure to use, but the result depends critically on what measure you use. And there's a whole literature out there proposing different measures to use in the multiverse. Because it's normally assumed that the ensemble is infinite, these uh, measures usually blow up and give you any answer you want because they are divergent. So there are numerous proposals for measures. The problems arise because of the infinities in the theory. And a typical paper is this one by Linda in Norbala, looking at different possible measures and trying to see which of them is plausible and which isn't. Now, supposing you do such an argument and you come out with a measure which you're going to apply to the multiverse, that's fine. So now you can argue for that measure and you say, this is a great measure. The key point then is there's no way to test your measure in a physical way. There's no measurements that will test that measure. There's no observations which will test that proposed measure. It's a philosophically justified element of the theory. So what happens here, as people do their multiverse theories and they're doing them in a very logical, consistent way, they're taking known physics and extrapolating it in a very sensible kind of way, they always end up making some assumptions which cannot be proven to be correct and therefore in my book, they are throwing in a, a philosophical element at that point. And this is a paper about that. If, in fact, no value L of the cosmological constant can prove a multi multiverse exists or doesn't exist, and that's elementary logic, the proof is that if the multiverse implies L, it does not follow that L implies M. So if the multiverse implies some specific value for the cosmological constant, you, you can't just assume that the inverse works. 
Disproof. If M implies L only probabilistically, it does not follow that not L implies not M either, although it may shorten the odds. If there's a valid context in which probability applies. In my view, there's no value of lambda that proves a multiverse exists. What, rather, what all of this work and the work by Weinberg, which is very important work because he's a very strong physicist, is a weak consistency test on multiverse. That is indicative but not conclusive because no probability argument can actually be falsified. These are consistency tests. They must be satisfied if the multiverse is true, but they're not confirmation unless no other explanation is possible. The problem of the vacuum energy is a real, real problem. Quantum field theory estimates are completely discrepant with what we are seeing out there. Is the multiverse the only solution? And the answer is no. If the vacuum doesn't gravitate, then we're okay. And the vacuum doesn't gravitate if you use the trace-free Einstein equations plus separate conservation equations. And this is what is known as unimodular gravity. And if you have unimodular gravity instead of general relativity, it solves the profound contradiction arising between quantum field theory and the Einstein field equations. In that case, the vacuum doesn't gravitate. And the way it works is as follows. These are the 10 Einstein field equations and they imply the conservation equations. What we do, instead of taking these 10 equations, we take the trace-free part. These angular brackets mean take the trace-free part. So take that equation, take the trace-free part. So that is RAB minus a quarter RGAB, that's a trace-free part. The trace-free part of G is zero. The trace-free part of G is zero, and the trace-free part of that is T minus a quarter T. So you take that as your field equations instead of that. And then you assume the conservation equation separately. So we're taking nine of the ten equations, the trace-free ones, and a separate conservation equations. Now, what you do is you take the divergence of these equations and use that equation, and you recover equation one, but with a crucial difference. Now lambda is a constant of integration and has nothing to do with the vacuum energy. And so in fact in this theory the vacuum energy doesn't gravitate because lambda is not going to be the, 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 the energy of the, the, the quantum vacuum. It's just going to be a, a constant which, um, <coughs> which you do a constant of integration. In Interestingly, Einstein tried this in 1919 and did it wrong. There are four possibilities. The Einstein equations, the Einstein tensor equals the, the matter tensor. You can go trace-free on the left or trace-free on the right or trace-free on both left and right. This is okay, this is okay, these two are not okay, and this is something that wasn't known in 1919 when Einstein did his theory. Einstein uh, took that theory. And this isn't a consistent theory because the symmetries don't, uh, aren't the same on the, the left and the right. So I believe we can solve that problem which is used as a motivation for the multiverse by using um, unimodular gravity, which Finkelstein, Unruh and many others have written, and a variation principle for it is given by Alvarez et al. Uh, Okay, it's been claimed that we can disprove the multiverse if there are closed spatial sections because the coverage is positive. Um, the claim is that only negatively curved Robertson-Walker models can emerge in a chaotic inflation multiverse. Now, some people say this and some don't. It's a very interesting question whether the universe is positively closed or not, but the point in the end is the following. We might live in a bubble with positive curvature, but th that doesn't prove that that positive curvature remains the same outside the domain that we can see. We can see within our domain. If we can only see a part of the universe and we find it positively curved in that part, it may still be true that the universe is inhomogeneous outside and um, is... Uh, and is not positively curved. If you take a positively curved model Robertson Walker inside the, the, the visible domain and just continue it outside in the obvious way, what you get is not a multiverse, you get a Robertson Walker model with k is plus one. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details of this because I need to get on to the key point here. 
The take-home message, various arguments for the multiverse are sound motivations for exploring it as a scientific theory. However, only in a small subset of such models might there be observational support or disproof. In all other cases, we have useful arguments that support the existence of the multiverses but are not testable. In each case, the argument is based on untestable and hence philosophical assumptions. Now the big issue is that the very nature of the scientific enterprise is at stake in the multiverse debate. The multiverse proponents are proposing weakening the nature of scientific proof in order to claim the multiverse provide a scientific explanation. This is a dangerous tactic. Now for instance, Suskin explicitly states the criteria for scientific theory should be weakened and Krach writes about that in that paper. And again, I emphasize we're dealing with really existing multiverses, not hypothetical or potential. Recent attempts to justify non-empirical theory confirmation, which um, I will talk about in half a minute, amount to a proposal for weakening the nature of science to a serious degree, even if it's based in Bayesian methods. It's a dangerous move because of current skepticism about science in many parts of society, vaccines, global warming, GMOs, nuclear power versus renewable energy. In each case, there's a solid scientific argument to be made in order that it persuade it's crucial that science itself is to be seen on solid ground, in particular of physics the model for the rest. If the physicists start loosening the grounds for, for what is science or not, it's a threat to all of the rest of this stuff. The criteria for scientific theory are satisfactory structure, consistency, simplicity and beauty or elegance, intrinsic explanatory power, logical tightness, the scope of the theory, unifying separate phenomena, extrinsic explanatory power, connectedness to the rest of science and extendability, a basis for further development, and observational and experimental support, the ability to make quantitative predictions that can be tested, confirmation, the degree to which such theory is supported. Now, your problem in cosmology, because there's only one universe model, is that in general in cosmology these will conflict with each other and you have to choose between these in cosmology in order to get a definite model. That's where the problem comes from. Now, in my view, this is the one you have to stick with through thick and thin and if you have to weaken some of the others, stick with this one and let go a little bit of the extrinsic or explanatory power but stick with this one in my opinion. Um, now the people who are supporting the multiverse uh, have used various words like paparazzi and falsibility police when they're talking about me. <laughs> Okay, uh, they result some emotional rhetoric and name calling, and this confirms the sociology of science emphasis on social and emotional factors affecting the outcomes. Um, there is a serious thing to do here in terms of the philosophy of science, talking about the Duhem Quine thesis, Lakatos Bayes theorem, and so on. Um, and if you've looked at the philosophy of science, yes, life isn't as simple just as proper. You, you have to take into account that when you do an experiment, you're not testing just that experiment. It's embedded in a whole a range of subsidiary assumptions, which you're also testing when you do that. And that's what Lakatos talks about. And But these don't change the essentials. You need data to test extrapolation from the known to the unthrown. And you only get confirmation without um, a one theory if there's through through these procedures um, without data if there's no other theory possible. How do you prove it's the only game in town? And this has been used particularly with string theory. The string theorists claim that string theory is the only theory which unifies string theory, uh, which unifies the four forces of physics. Now, and they, they're using that to say, so, so one of the ways that people try to justify um, a theory here without experimental confirmation is to say it's the only game in town. Now, the problem there is how do you know that any such game exists? And if we go back to the distinction between string theory and loop quantum gravity, string theory tries to unify all the fundamental forces in one theory, whereas the loop quantum gravity people just try to quantize gravity and they don't to try to unify it with all the other forces. Now, as a general relativist, and from our viewpoint, gravity isn't actually a force at all. It's an outcome of space-time curvature. So if gravity isn't a force, there's a kind of a, a problem trying to unify the four forces of nature if one of these isn't actually a force at all. <laughs> okay. um, and then if you say it's the only game in town, 
uh, uh, you have to be very, very careful. You must remember the failures such as SU5. When um, inflationary theory was started, everybody assumed that SU5 was the grand unified theory. If you read the, the papers from that time, that was assumed pretty much it had to be the case, and it wasn't the case. Using Bayes' theorem, you have to assume a prior, and basically you can get any output for your result depending on the prior that you use. But the much more important point for the moment, what you'll find for the people who are now pushing this kind of weakening of science theory, they're trying to say that the new thing we put in, the new, we, we can bring in something new, we can bring in a new evaluation of the theory, and that upstates the probabilities. Now, do you believe that a new evaluation of the theory gives you better confirmation, or do you require that it's a new, evalu a new data coming in in order to, um, to validly use Bayes' theorem? So there was this meeting in Munich last year, Richard David, String Theory and the Scientific Me Method, and he proposes three different ways of justifying a theory when you don't have um, new data. The no alternatives argument, which I've just been talking about, the meta-inductive argument, other compar comparable theories tend to be successful later on, and the unextended uh, exp explanation argument, the theory explains something without having been developed to that end. So he suggests in the case of string theory that these are the different ways that you can justify a theory even if you don't have any data to support it. Now, the first thing is that these are philosophical principles. So he's introducing a set of philosophical principles. If they work, then philosophical assumptions imply multiverses or string theory are worth investigating. But can you use them to say the theory is actually true? And in my opinion, you can't. Now, if you look at multiverses, no alternative arguments. There, is there an alternative? Yes, no multiverse exists. <laughs> Meta-inductive argument. Comparable theories tend to be successful later on. Uh, the problem with this is there counter the meta-meta-inductive argument. There are counter examples where this argument hasn't worked. The SU5 theory that I've mentioned, um, comparable. So we had theories of unification of the, the, the electroweak force and people extended to the strong force to grand unified theories and they thought that this theory must be successful because it was so obviously the unique one and it didn't work. If you look back in the history of cosmology, um, people assumed at the time, 1917 to, 1920, to 1930, all cosmologists, excepting for two, assumed that the universe was static. The community knew the universe was static. And just because they had that theory at that time didn't mean it was true. And then people assumed that the einstein de city universe was the correct model of the universe, and no, it wasn't. It isn't because of the cosmological constant. And then unexpected explanation argument, the theory explained must explain something without having been developed to that end, but it must explain testable physics, not just theory, else it's just more development of untestable theory. In fact, the multiverse explains anything at all. If you've got a real multiverse in which anything possible happens, then somewhere out there there's a part of the multiverse in which Harry Potter exists. If you want to follow this argument in some detail, you can go to a website for Why Trust a Theory, Reconsidering Scientific Methodology in Light of Modern Physics, held in December 2015 at the Ludwig Maximilian University, and you can find it up there. Getting down to brass tacks, the question is what data or observation would lead to you abandoning the multiverse? If there is no data which will lead you to abandoning the multiverse, it's a dogma, not a scientific theory. If there's none, it's a dogma. Because a multiverse can explain anything in a multiverse, if it's an Ill infinite one in which anything happens that can happen, as for instance Mac Tegsmark assumes, then the answer is likely to be um, that there's no, nothing which will make you abandon it, because anything which happens can be explained somewhere in a multiverse by the kind of argument we've been given. Now, if this is... If, if there's no data which would lead you to abandoning the multiverse model, you should state that. Please state clearly what the data is which will make you abandon the multiverse and then stick to that implied commitment. Um, 
And that, so that is the thing that a multiverse proponent needs to do to make this a scientific theory. They need to state this data would make me abandon the multiverse and they then need to stick to that theory. So what is needed to change the situation is a viable set of criteria procedures for what makes a theory scientific. Find what methods can adequately justify unobservable entities. Apply to the multiverse case. Whatever theory you, whatever criterion you have for what a scientific theory is, and you're going to apply to the multiverse, it must also work when you apply it to intelligent design, astrology, and so on. Because if you weaken your th what a scientific theory is enough to accommodate the multiverse theory, the question for you is, have you weakened it so much that it will also accommodate astrology and intelligent design? And that's what's needed to put the enterprise on a solid philosophical basis. And so the take-home message is the various arguments for claiming the multiverse is established science do so by, in one way or another, weakening the usual standards for a theory to be considered scientific. Unless you state that criterion and then you stick to that criterion. But most people there don't know. Let me give credit to Suskin. He says he will abandon the, the multiverse theory if we prove that the spatial sections have negative curvature. Okay? At the moment, the data coming in on cosmology isn't good enough to tell if the spatial sections are positively curved, negatively curved, or not. Um, and so, so Suskin, in fact, has stuck his nails, uh, stuck his flag to the mast in that case, and that means that he is, in that way, fulfilling what I'm asking for. Changing any of the criteria for science should be done with extreme care, else it will be a giant step backwards to before Galileo and the establishment of the basis of successful scientific theories. And having a well-developed mathematical theory is not sufficient. Some people seem to think we've got this mathematical theory, therefore it applies to the universe. Some of the string theory community seem to basically believe that. Just because you've got a mathematical theory doesn't mean it applies to the real universe. I'll stop at that point. I was going to say something about infinities, but um, I'll have to leave that.